own into this place. And I pray that it looms and hovers over the house today as we talk about your spirit. We talk about the value, the need, the power of your spirit, God. Today is spirit day in this house. And I pray, God, that your spirit would do what it wants to do in every heart, every mind, every soul, every home, every marriage, God. We release the spirit in the name of Jesus. We let this be so. If you agree with that, could you shout back amen? Amen. 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 Thank you for standing. You can be seated this morning. It matters. The Spirit. Fulfilled prophecy. It was in Isaiah 28 and 11, which was a prophetic word. The Old Testament in Joel 2.28 talked about the forthcoming of the Spirit, the outpouring of God's Spirit upon people. This is what we learned about the Spirit, that it brought unity when it was poured out. It brought a visual expression of God. The Old Testament, there was God. The Bible says that God is a Spirit, and a Spirit hath not flesh and bones. And so God was a Spirit there, and it was a demonstration of how he ministered to his people, and word got out. And he talked to Moses in a burning bush. That was God. He talked to Balaam in a donkey. That was God, but there's something about the Spirit of God that God sent His Spirit from heaven, and it was a visual expression of God. It brought an open door to power for every one of us. The Spirit, or the Holy Spirit, brought the wonderful works of God in Acts chapter 2 and verse 11. In Acts chapter 2 and 15, it brought a demonstration of what God can do in the Spirit in Acts 2 and 17. It brought the fulfillment of a vision or a prophetic word, which was back in Isaiah and the prophet Joel. It brought the fulfillment of dreams, also in Acts 2 and 17. The Spirit brought the fulfillment of the promise in Acts chapter 2 and verse 39. For this promise is unto you and unto their children and to their children. In other words, it doesn't evaporate. It's not extinct. It's for every generation. It was a promise, and the Spirit brought sacrifice to God's people in Acts 2 and 45. You see, what I think the Spirit did, it was a connection from the vertical to the horizontal in Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. There was something about the Spirit that began to change the way people related with God. There was something about the Spirit that began to move into people's hearts. And it was not some mystical thing happened on the horizon. It was not people looking for a burning bush. It was not people looking for animals to talk back. It was not people looking for clouds and pillars of fire to move. But now God said, I'm going to send my spirit into the world. And it's going to loom not only around you, but now it's going to be inside of you. You see, the outside of the Old Testament, of the Old Testament, rather, his spirit or his voice was an outside manifestation The beautiful thing about the Spirit and why it matters now is because now God is an internal manifestation of who He is. It's called the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. So you don't have to be where the man Christ Jesus is. You just have to be where the Spirit is talking and where the Spirit is moving and where the Spirit is healing. And when you understand that, then you understand why it matters. Because Pentecost cannot be Pentecost without a Spirit. We cannot be apostolic without a Spirit. It takes the spirit of the almighty God that is now not just showing me signs and wonders through my eyes, but he is speaking into the hearts of millions of Christians. And if you've been filled with God's spirit, according to the new birth experience, and you begin to speak with tongues as the spirit gave utterance, that's God speaking through you to a sign that God has filled you with his spirit. And when you have that spirit, then you have the power and you have the authority to speak into things and call things that are not as though they are. That's why the spirit matters. Can you shout amen? Maybe you're here and you're not familiar with the Spirit. Acts 18 and 26 says, And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. I'm expounding of what God is wanting to do in your life if you've not been filled with the new birth experience. Nothing is being discredited of what anybody knows according to the word. 
We're not trying to one-up any theologian in the house this morning. We're just simply saying, hey, there is a spirit that is available for you that is not a gift in 1 Corinthians 13. The spirit is God's spirit poured out in the book of Acts. It is a spirit that lives inside of us and that guides us. How can we live holy in an unholy world? Because it's the spirit of God that resides in me, Brother Gustavo. How can I be a spiritual man when I am made of carnality and flesh? It's because it's the spirit of God that allows us to do what God's called us to do. How can we walk according to faith and not after the flesh? Because it's the Spirit of God that lives inside of us. It's not just a story. It's just not a chapter in the Old Testament. But now it's God's Spirit living inside of people. My friend, can I tell you this morning, that's why it matters. Oh, someone shout back, it matters. How could you sustain yourself on the journey till you walk on streets of gold without the Spirit? You can't. Because the Spirit is a transformational relationship with God. Transformation is defined as a change in form, an appearance, a nature, or character. There is something more about Pentecost, something deeper about Pentecost. It's what makes the difference because it matters. It's the spirit that makes the difference. It's the infilling that makes the difference. It's revelational that makes the difference. It's apostolic. It's original. It's authentic. There's something what the spirit does. Can I tell you, my friend, when you come in contact with the spirit of God, there is something that you understand and you realize that this is more powerful than anything upon earth. This is smarter than anything I could ever know. This is richer than anything I could ever buy. And God's saying, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and you shall dream dreams and you shall prophesy. And there's coming a day, the prophet said, that his spirit is for everyone and for your children and their children and generations to follow, and it picks up in the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost, chapter 2, where his spirit was poured out, and it fulfilled the prophetic word of the Old Testament prophets. There's something about the spirit that matters. We are apostolic. We are Pentecostal. On the I-15, there's a 12-foot sign by 4-foot high that says, True Vine Pentecostal Church. Pentecostal says, We are spirit-filled. We are led by the spirit. We are fed by the spirit. We are walking by the spirit. And it's that Holy Ghost spirit that makes this church honorable in the sight of God. Shout yes! Woo, it matters. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, it matters. We don't worship like other churches. We don't pray like other churches. We don't preach like other preachers. We don't get saved like a lot of other churches. Our altar services are not like a lot of other churches because there's a spirit that's the element, that's a dynamic that we lean on and we depend on and we crave and we hunger and we thirst after a move of God in the spirit. And when that doesn't happen, frankly, we become a little disappointed. Huh? Woo! Thank you, praise team, for helping enter and bring in the spirit of God. We called you down here for prayer. If you need a prayer, we're going to anoint you with oil. The book of James says, and you shall recover, and you shall do these and these things. But I got to looking around, and as people were being prayed for, I saw the Spirit moving in the altar service. And I felt the Spirit coming from a praise team that is bringing me into the Holy of Holies. Because without the Spirit, I'm going to leave the same way that I came in. And without the Spirit, I'm going to be the same old carnal man that I was before I received the Spirit. Ha! Ah. What's the big deal, Pastor? Because it matters. Matters to me. And I'm the pastor. So I get to preach whatever matters to me. Way more important to me, it matters here. And so, yes, the spirit. We're not in the same business on this property here as other businesses. We are not interested in just creating a church for consumers. We want people to experience the spirit of God. And just so that you know, I understand that no program or event can substitute the spirit of God. Hello, somebody. 
It's the spirit that can take you to a dimension you can't get on your own. You can try to be good. You can try to be nice. You can try to be kind. But you can only get so far because you're working with a human spirit. But when you begin to talk about the spirit of God and what God can do, God can take us where he thinks we need to go that we could not get on our own. But the vehicle or the bridge to get there is the spirit of God that lives inside of me and that lives inside of you. And if it doesn't live inside of you, then today for you it's spirit day. How? What does that mean? All you got to do is repent. Repent? I didn't do nothing wrong. Maybe you didn't, but you were born into sin, the Bible says. You can take that up with Adam and Eve at some point, but nevertheless, you were. But it matters. It's the spirit that we need. It's the spirit that you expect from me when I step behind this sacred desk in this pulpit to stand up here and to preach you a message from God that I have heard from God in the spirit and you expect me to connect in the spirit. And quite honestly, I expect you to receive in the spirit and push back on your flesh and push back on your carnality and push back on the world and push back on the pressure and say, hey, this feels right in my spirit, maybe not in my flesh, but if the spirit matters, then I receive what God's telling me today. 138 times in the King James Version, the word spirit appears where it's a capital S. Capital S is referring to the deity of God. 138 times. The NIV Version, it's mentioned 246 times. That must be an important word. I'm talking about the capital S. I'm talking about the reference to the spirit or the deity of God. And the Spirit of God blew in the room. And the Spirit of God spoke to the dry bones in Ezekiel 37. The Spirit of God hovered upon the land. The Spirit of God came upon the prophet. The Spirit of God worked through the shadow when he was made whole. It was God moving. It was the Spirit. It was the anointing. It was God manifesting himself through somebody that received the Holy Spirit after the book of Acts. And so that's why I say since we're living after the book of Acts... And if you do the math on your calendars and your dates, most people believe that the book of Acts and the day of Pentecost was about 2,000 years ago. So 2,000 years later, yes, it matters. And I think maybe it matters more so because the longer we live, the darker this generation gets. And pretty soon there's no lines and there's no absolutes. And nothing measures up. And at some point you have to ask a generation, well, then what is sin? If you can try to explain it all and justify all of it, and you can put it under the land and the law of fad and fashion and culture, then what is sin? The Spirit will tell you what sin is. You don't need a book. If this was stripped away from me, Brother John, I I think I could still walk after the Spirit because it's God inside of me guiding my footsteps, giving me understanding and knowledge. I need the Word of God. I read. I get revelation. I enjoy the stories. It feels good in my spirit. But even if if I was not tethered to this, the Spirit of God can still help you walk holy and righteous because the longer we live on earth, the more wicked and dark this world gets. And the church and the Spirit of God has never moved, and the world was here, and the world gets worse and worse, and every generation gets darker and darker. And so the distance between the world and the church gets further and further. And at some point, the church is so far from the world, people think the church is old-fashioned, when in reality, the church never moved. Oh, come on, somebody. That was a revelation. It's the world and the generations and the courts and the law and the fads and the culture that swing away from the world. And if I'm tethered to this world at some point, I'm going to think the church is old-fashioned and irrelevant. But I'm telling you, hey, when the spirit is where it's going to be, the spirit is never old-fashioned. The spirit is never extinct. The spirit is never not going to do its job. The spirit is always going to do what it's come to do. Even 2,000 years later in a town in Old Town Temecula, God can still fill you with the spirit of his self and he can make you a brand new creature in Christ Jesus according to the word of God for without the spirit we're nothing without the spirit we are hopeless without the spirit you are powerless without the spirit we are defeatable we can be defeated and without the spirit we are incapable of living a life pleasing to God without the spirit watch me now I don't want to mess up your theology but listen to me without the spirit you are unable to experience the new birth. Mm. Because one-third of the new birth is the the spirit. 
It's repentance. It's baptism in the name of Jesus. We wash away your sins. And then God fills you with his spirit. The spirit is what sets the Pentecostal and Apostolic Church apart from the world. There are a lot of spirits out there. You all have a human spirit, but it's not a capital S. It's a lowercase s. But when you have the Spirit of God, it becomes a capital S in you, and it becomes the power. What do you say in Acts 1? You shall receive power after that. The Holy Ghost has come upon you. What do you say in Acts? It go to you be endued with power from on high. Wait for me. The King James says, endued, you're going to be empowered with my Spirit. Some Bible scholars believe that there was about 500, I think, Brother French, that went up there in the room. They had Pentecost, and they all got impatient or whatever they had to do. Their wife called them, man, when are you going to hang this picture? When are you going to fix this light bulb? Okay, okay, I'll leave the upper room. What do you want? When are you going to take the trash out? Can it just wait? God's Spirit hasn't come yet. I can imagine all the conversations, right, like our wives. <laughs> when are you going to come take me to dinner? When are you going to fix this? But when it all settled down, 120 of them told their wives, I ain't coming. Now, there might have been ladies there. I don't want to discredit that, okay? Not today, mama. That stuff can wait. Jesus hasn't come back. They pushed back on some stuff because they, they stayed. Estimated some 380 said, ah, oh, he's not coming. I don't know what he's talking about. Maybe I misunderstood him. But some people were desperate for the outpouring of the Spirit, capital S. Why? Because it mattered to them, and I think it mattered to Jesus when he said, you go wait. And it's the Spirit that is part of the new birth experience. We repent, we're baptized. Look at this. Let me show you the importance of the Spirit. Let me show you how it matters. John 3, 5. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of the water. What is the water? That's baptism. And this is what is significant to me. In the King James, it says, And of the Spirit, and it has a capital S. Just know, whenever you study your Bible, you go through, find anything that says Spirit. If it's a capital S, it's referring to Him. Okay, John 3, 5 says, and of the Spirit, Brother Foster. And watch this. If you're not born of the water and the Spirit, comma, this is the word I'm reading to you verbatim, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Okay, so water and Spirit must be pretty important and relevant, and it must matter. This is a conversation of Nicodemus that goes to Jesus at night in John 3, 5. Jesus says to Nicodemus in verse 6, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of Spirit is spirit. And it's like Jesus just makes a final point in verse 7. He tells Nicodemus, Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. It matters that you have the spirit. Because if you're here this morning like I, I think we want to see the kingdom of God. But the Bible says I cannot see the kingdom of God unless I've been born of water and spirit. And what precedes water is my repented heart. And say, well, I've already experienced a new birth experience. Well, then you better make sure you're full of the Spirit. And if you're not full of the Spirit and it's not moving and it's not fluid in your life, in a few minutes you need to come down here and get a refilling. Because you can't see the kingdom of God without the Spirit. If you don't have the Spirit, I'm just telling you what the Word says. All I'm saying is it's not an option. John 4.24 says God is a Spirit. Capital S. And that spirit matters. It's the book of Acts and the outpouring that they were waiting for. The promise. The power. See, I understand this. This is why it matters so much. Jesus is walking. He's ministering on earth. He's, the gospels record his, his story. And then he says, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. Now, I, watch. Okay, you're going to leave me, but you're not going to leave me comfortless. You're going to go away? So how do you process that? You're going to leave, but I'm okay. So something else has to take place. Something has to replace this relationship that I have with the man Christ Jesus. Okay, I'm going to go away, but I'm not going to leave you comfortless. So what are you going to do? I'm going to send a spirit. Uh, excuse me, sir, whose spirit? My spirit. Can you do that? I'm God. And how will I recognize it? You will speak with new tongues. And where will it dwell? Inside of you. Now, can I be honest with you? We're living in the dispensation of grace. It's the last dispensation, then Jesus comes, right? I'm not a real big, deep theologian, but I do know that much. 
Brother French, I think personally we got the best deal. I didn't want to live in the dispensation of innocence. That's back in the Garden of Eden. You, can, you know you can mess that up. Look at them. <laughs> All the other dispensations, I can't even, I don't, can't even remember what they are now. I'm not that smart, but I just know I'm in the dispensation of grace. And God's saying, hey, I'll tell you how you're going to do it. I'm going to leave my spirit. You're going to receive my spirit. That's how I'm not going to leave you comfortless. You see, when you were walking in the Bible days in the Gospels, you had to be around Jesus to get touched by Jesus and hear the words of Jesus. And what if Jesus wasn't in your city? You're out of luck. So you mean I got to go where Jesus is to get healed? Yeah, yes, you do. Well, where is he? I don't know. You got to find him. News will spread abroad. Just hang tight. How long of a journey is it? That depends on where he is and where you're at. And now he says, hey, we're going to do it different. I'm going to leave, and then I'm going to give you my spirit that dwells inside. In Jesus, it was his spirit robed in flesh. So in some way, Brother Gustavo, he's going to rip away the flesh and give you the spirit. Up here, that don't sound logical. If everything has to be logical for you to understand the spirit, you're never going to get it. If it all has to make sense with a number two pencil and a legal pad on an Excel sheet, it's never going to work. Because that's the flesh, that's the mind, that's the carnality. That's the lowercase spirit of man. But God said, I'm going to strip away my flesh, and I'm going to bring my spirit, and I'm going to pour it in everybody that wants it. And not just your generation, for your children and their children and their children too. Oh, you mean my, my grandchildren that haven't even been born yet? Yeah. yeah. I'm prophesying for all of you. And so that, that's why it matters. Because now he has brought his spirit to reside and dwell inside all of us. That when he comes back for a church, the Bible says, watch me now, without spot or blemish or wrinkle, how do you have the ability or the power to live like that in a world that is, has spots and has wrinkles and has blemishes? Because it's the spirit that sustains you to live in an, uh, an environment that is not conducive to this. It insulates who I am. And the promise that God would not leave them would be unfulfilled. Watch this in John 14. He says, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him. You know him. Watch this. For he, dwell with, he dwells with you, and he shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come again unto you. Let me read verse 17. This is the easy to read version. I like the translation here. It says, the helper is the spirit of truth. It's a capital S here. The people of the world cannot accept him because they don't see him or know him. Watch this. But you know him. He lives with you. And he will be in you. Hallelujah. That's a prophetic word and a promise that has come from the book of John. He shall be with you. When he was on earth, when he was in flesh form, he was with people. Watch me now, okay? This is a revelation. Old Testament was the sp- God. God is a spirit. We know God's a spirit, okay? The Old Testament, there was no Jesus. There was no Holy Ghost, okay? Just God. Manifestations of God. Spiritual intuitions of God. Inclinations of God. I'm going to put a cloud here. I'm going to put a pillar of fire by night. I'm going to talk through a bush. If you'll strike that rock, water will come out. If you stretch over here, we'll part the Red Sea. If you'll do this, if you'll do that. But the foster, it was just God moving up on the land. And then the Old Testament closes. 400 years, nothing happens. Then the Gospels pick up and Jesus is born. The prophetic word. Isaiah 9, 6. For unto you a child is born, unto you a Savior is given. How's it go, Brother Foster? Okay. (laughs) Yeah, we're we're streaming live, so you shouldn't be schooling the pastor when he's preaching. (laughs) I I got six of the words right. Come on. I'm glad you didn't shout it out. They didn't hear you online. Okay, let me back to my story. Brother Foster messed me up. 
I'm not calling on him no more. <laughs> Brother Mark or Brother John, you can come, but listen to me, okay? I want to show you, I want to show you a revelation God gave me a while back. In the Old Testament, it was God. So it was just a spirit kind of roaming to and fro. The Gospels picks up, and that spirit of God embodies himself with flesh. Okay, the man Christ Jesus. They kill the fleshly Jesus. Okay, see, whenever on the scene of generations, none of these manifestations of God overlapped. The Old Testament was God. You can't find Jesus in the Old Testament. You can't find the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. You can only find prophetic words, hey, this is coming. Isaiah 9, 6 says, hey, there's coming a baby Jesus someday. Joel and Isaiah say, hey, there's coming an outpouring of the Spirit. But they don't overlap. They don't intermix. They, their, their time frames don't, you see. So then Jesus is born. And his prophetic word, he's going to come save his people. But then here's the problem. They kill the baby Jesus. He's 33 years old. He's a man now. Signs and wonders and miracles. So now that they're taking away the flesh, humanly, they're taking away the human part of Jesus, how do we survive? So now God says, I used to roam to and fro externally. Then I put my spirit inside of a flesh body and I came. And that didn't work for the people. Now when I come back again, I'm going to live inside of you. That's the prophetic word. So you see, there, there's no baby Jesus anymore. But we celebrate the resurrection on Easter. The resurrection, his body's gone. Fifty days later, the master plan of God says, I used to be external in the Old Testament. I filled my own body with the Spirit. I'm not going to contain it to just me. Now I'm going to give it to anybody that wants it. And now, and he says, you sh greater work shall you do. Yes. Hello, somebody. The spirit, it matters. Yes, so, pastor, are you saying the spirit that was in the body of Jesus is the same spirit that's in me? Yes, yes, yes. So you better treat that spirit right. Don't abuse it. Don't taint it. Don't put it in an environment that it can't survive and live. Hello, somebody. It matters. So let me get this. The spirit that was in the man Jesus, that spirit and that body resurrected from the grave. And then this time, the wisdom of God said, okay, I'm not going to send a body. I'm not going to send an external spirit. I'm going to send an internal spirit. And I'm going to wait 50 days after I'm raised from the dead. Then I'm going to blow them up like I told them I was going to do it. True statement. So if you are living for God without the Spirit, you're missing power. You're missing that internal power. And that's why he said, Whatsoever you shall ask in my name, I shall do it. In prayer, touching any one thing, I shall do it. It's the power of the Spirit. So, Brother Garcia, you and I, we have the same spirit that was in Jesus. We have the same ability, the power. That, that's why I say it matters. And if you're not received that spirit, today's the day for you. All you have to do is repent. There's two things. Watch me now. Components of the new birth experience is three things. Two of them you control. You are in the driver's seat. You repent, and you choose to be baptized. But since it's so important, and so, I want to say, spiritually sensitive, God said, I'll do the last one. Don't you touch it. You leave that to me. Okay? So there's two things that I must do in order to receive what he wants to do. It matters. If you've not repented, come on, today's your day. Sister Sharice, Spirit Day. You're right. 
We have water. We have robes. We have towels. If you've not been baptized, you, we choose to be baptized. Okay? Will you baptize me? Absolutely. And then God chooses to fill you with his spirit. He blows into your inner being. How do I know I receive the spirit? Because you begin to speak with tongues according to the word. It's a sign to the believer. So if you've ever spoke with new tongues that you did not know what you're saying, that is God flowing, that is God filling you up with his spirit. And that's a validation in your mind, the Bible says it's a sign to the believer, that, that you have just received the spirit. That's a God thing. I can't touch that. But what I can touch, Brother Foster, is repentance and baptism. And if I'm not willing to do those two, I don't know how God's going to trust your natural human body with his spirit that's so holy when you won't do two things you're supposed to do. Mm, I'm almost preaching. Did you catch it? Because it's a divine spirit, it's a holy spirit, and he can't put it in old wineskins. Well, that's a weird word. Pastor, where would you get that from? Come on, that's in the Bible. You don't know your Bible? Wineskins. Come on, this is the Temecula Valley. Hello, do you know where you live? Wineskins. What is he saying? He's saying, you know what, I can't pour my spirit in someone that has not repented and been baptized because I'm putting new wine into old wineskins. I'm going to put new wine into new wineskins when I do the two things I'm supposed to do. And so it really matters what you do. It matters what I do. And then once God fills you with the Spirit, then I've got an obligation. I've got to maintain that. It matters. Not once saved, always saved. I can't find scriptural precedence and reference for that. I can find quite the contrary. Where Paul, in essence, is saying, you know what, I repent daily. I die daily. I just die to this. I have, my flesh has to die out because I'm a carnal man. What's carnal? That's just my fleshly nature. And this flesh of who I am and who I have a tendency to be is kept under subjection because God's spirit is living inside the flesh of Tom Durant's. And Tom Durant's never really manifests because Tom Durant's is a human being. And God says, that's a man I'm pleased with. That's a woman. That's a marriage. Why, why are you pleased with me, God? Because you're maintaining my spirit in a way that I appreciate it. You're not taking me places you shouldn't go. You're not exposing me to environments. You're not, you're not, you see, hello. But you say, well, how can I do that? Because when you receive the spirit, you receive the power to do that. You can't comprehend that in your natural mind. Well, what if I mess up God's spirit? No, when God fills you, he gives you the power not to mess it up. I mean, you've got to go to great lengths to mess it up. And people can, and there have been people that have done that. That's not the will of God. I'm going to end with this, but if you've not been baptized, come on, let us baptize you. If you're not repented, you could do that sitting in your chair. That's just saying, hey, God, I'm a sinner. I just got it. I got a revelation. Some of you might say, God, I'm an idiot. I'm a jerk. I finally confess what my wife's been telling me. Don't tell her I said that. But between you and I, she's right. I'm sorry. I've been a horrible father. I've been selfish. I've held a grudge. I've been wounded. I'm bitter. God, take this from me. God's saying, fine, I'll take it from you. Let me wash away your sins in baptism. And then when I get all that gooey, gunky stuff off you. I'm going to fill you with a pristine Holy Spirit and you're going to live from this day forward because it matters. So wherever you are in life, the Spirit matters. If you're on the front end of the Spirit and you don't get it, it matters. If you're well into your journey like I am, it matters to sustain myself on the journey. So nobody ever outgrows the significance of the Spirit. You never get to a point to where you say, it doesn't matter. You never get to that point until you walk on streets of gold. Then I guess it doesn't matter. And God's just saying, hey, if I've not filled you with my spirit, I want to do that today. If I have filled you with my spirit, I need to kind of top you off and give you a little more spirit 
so that you can continue this journey and you can climb the next mountain. You can walk through the next desert. I will never leave you or I will never forsake you, but you will carry me wherever you go and you don't have to run looking for me because I'm where you're at. Hello. Hmm. This matters to me. This matters to apostolic churches and pastors. Hallelujah. I want to pray with us. If you're able to stand, could you stand with us this morning in closing? Mighty God, we come to the conclusion of this service. Your spirit, God, has been championed and highlighted. It's been explained, God, and it's been articulated to the best we can. I pray that you would do what you do now. If we need to repent, God, we repent. If we need to be baptized today, we get baptized. We wash away the old, miry clay of who we are, and we come up a new creature in Christ Jesus, and old things are passed away. And then when you have a clean, pristine body, you fill it with your spirit, and you make it holy. This matters to us, God. This matters to us. Let us not be ignorant of how you explain things. Let us not be ignorant, God, of the process. But I pray that the Spirit of God would come from the portals of heaven this morning into a little church in Temecula. And it would begin to knock on every heart's door to either A, bring an infusion of the Spirit or bring a refilling, God. And we receive from heaven today. Let us not be embarrassed let us not be ashamed of where we are, but let your spirit lead and guide us into deeper waters, God, as you talked about in Ezekiel. Waters to swim in, I pray, God. Wherever we are on the bank and the shore, God, ankle deep and knee deep and waist deep and swimming in waters, God, I pray that you'd bring another flow of the Holy Ghost that came in on the day of Pentecost, God. And cloven tongues like as a fire set up on them and they begin to speak with no tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance, God, let that be so again today in anybody's life that is willing to receive this. I pray the Holy Ghost, God, would have a way in the next 10 minutes here in the name of Jesus. We speak this into the hearts of people. We speak this into the city. I speak this into the community today, God. I speak this into the church today by a prophetic word of authority that comes from heaven. Huh? In your name, I pray I open the altars to you, my friend. Lift up your hands. Lift up your voice. Find an altar somewhere. Ministry staff, would you help me? Come on, God wants to pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. Upon all flesh. The altars are open. Come on, you want to receive a fresh anointing? Lift your hands. Begin to thank God with your mouth. Let your words and your voice ring out. Spirit.